Welcome to Tailoring Talk with your host, Roberto Rivilla, bespoke tailor and owner of Roberto Rivilla London Suit and Shirt Makers. It's the podcast where I take you on a journey around the globe. We'll either be talking tailoring or I'll be tailoring the talk. We'll meet a host of amazing human beings, creators, self-starters, performers, and more to learn about their journeys and lessons they've learned. They share their top tips and life hacks to guide you on the path to success. Please support my show by subscribing, and it helps so much if you take a few seconds to rate and review. I'm joined by a veteran of sales and business development with over 25 years of experience. She loves helping entrepreneurs and small businesses get the right support to scale and succeed. Turned off by aspects of sales that are sleazy, he's passionate about empathetic and relational sales and helping people gain the confidence they need to sell in the first place here to set you on the path to mastering the sales process whatever you do please join me in welcoming darlene pride to the tailoring talk show darlene how are you i am great thank you so much for having me roberto you're welcome thank you so much for being here and uh, public apology for being late on to the call um and you've been very very gracious and i really appreciate that um so you are calling in all the way from Florida. Yes, Orlando. Well, Orlando area. Yeah, I love Orlando because of Disneyland. Is it Disneyland or Disney World in Orlando? It's Disney World. Yeah, it's Disney World. And I'm originally from New Jersey, but um, we moved down here about a year ago. Oh, wow. How are you finding it? We love it. And my daughter lives in the city of Orlando. She's actually a performer at SeaWorld. So we wanted to be closer to her. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I have been to Disney World Orlando. It was part of a company trip. um, And I just had such a fun time there. I just felt like, I mean, I was 29 probably at the time or 30. But I still felt the place just makes you feel like a little kid. It does for sure. Um, but New Jersey, I've got some, uh, got some, I've got loads of stories about New Jersey actually, but yeah, New Jersey is a cool place. Well, I grew up there and, um, then probably I lived in Georgia for about 15 years, raising my daughter and different things like that. Georgia was a, I knew I wasn't staying there. It's beautiful, but it was not my place. Um, yeah. So I'm definitely, but you know, it's a law when you live in New Jersey, you have to eventually land in Florida at some point. So. Yeah, that's like a, that's so that's a rule. It is. It is. Once you hit a certain age and I'm not going to tell you what that is, you got to go down. (laughs) Well, you know, I I had you pegged in sort of like early to mid thirties because I figured that you'd started in sales when you were about 10, 11 years old or something, right? Perfect. You're like, yes, absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) um but i mean to actually on that point um you know something with that we spoke about in the in the the pre-talk you know when it comes to sales we've all been doing it right because there'll be people listening to this that are like you know this is my thing and then there'll be other people listening to this like i'm not a salesperson you hear i'm not a born salesperson and that person's a born sale. we're all born i believe we're all born salespeople. yes what do you think about that I think so. Um, As we discussed, like there's a lot of negotiation, right? Just in life. And um, when you, and you use the analogy of your parents, which is, you know, it's true. You're trying to sell them on what you want, like, you know, to get their permission to do things. And I think we just naturally do it. We don't label it as, as sales. We may not get paid for it, but every position is a sales position. Absolutely. And the landscape of um, now talking about actual sales sales from a business point of view, the landscape has just changed so much over the last couple of decades. Um, you know, I mean, when you think, I mean, when I started out, it was like mid to late 90s. My first job was in a retail store selling electronics um, and then progressing to a technology company. I always wanted to be in fashion, but for one reason or another, I just couldn't get my foot in the door. And then eventually I did in the early 2000s. 
and I mean just the pace of technology it's almost like you and I we've just kind of lived through uh, as young as we are by the way um, (laughs) we've just (laughs) we've just lived through this this period where technology has just accelerated um, things just faster than I can ever remember before at any point in in my life you know and I'm a kid that grew up in the 80s and 90s Um, and it seems that there are more ways for people to do sales equally badly as much as there are ways for them to do sales well nowadays. Yeah, 100%. And I think because it's an information, we're always bombarded with information. So there's webinars, there's seminars, there's read my book, do all of that, right? There are so many people out there teaching sales in a bad way. Um, where people who may not have the confidence to sell think this is, I have to morph myself into this person in order to do sales right. And the reality is you can get good results in sales and still not be a good salesperson, right? Yeah, 100%. Um, Just take, because for the audience, obviously they don't know you. So what I always like to do is before we get into the meat is, is, is just, if you can just take us back a little bit and just kind of give us a flavor of how you started out in sales and then kind of some of the experiences that that you may have had or come across or environments that you'd been in that then sort of shaped, you know, where you got to today and your philosophy when it comes to when it comes to your favorite subject. Sorry, I was talking so much there that I ran out of breath. <laughs> well, um, I, I started in retail sales when I was 17 um, at Macy's and um, I always loved fashion. You know, I was, I was a child of the eighties. Imagine the fashion then. Right. Uh, and, you know, Jersey, the whole big hair thing. And, um, but What I did was, you know, obviously it was a job. Nobody taught you how to do anything. But because I was in fashion, I saw I saw early on that people were trusting me. I might have been 16, trusting me for my opinion on what looked good, what didn't look good. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't just out to make a sale. So that I think if I'm to look back, really started that foundation of trust versus selling. Um, So I worked for Macy's for years. I went to Laboratory Institute of Merchandising in New York City. I got a fashion merchandising degree. My first job, and I was just so blessed with my career. My first job was with Harvey Bernard. You're probably familiar with them, um, with the men's suits and different things like that. But they, you know, they also had a women's line. And I worked with the owner's daughters, and we did the accessories. Um, And we were buyers at the time. But even being buyers, you have to look at the end game, who is going to, you know, who are you selling to, even if I wasn't directly selling. And just like, you know, when you create something, you have the person that's buying it in mind. So again, that is a responsibility and a trust to make sure that you're really giving them what looks good, what's a good value, all of those different things. And like I said, I was blessed to work for such a great company that taught me those um, intrinsic values of, you know, quality and value and really, you know, integrity throughout. Um, So that's really where it started. So nobody really taught me how to sell. It was just that through experience, I just started doing what I innately thought was right. Yeah, the same for me as well, because when I started in retail, so unfortunately, it wasn't fashion, but um, but I was was in a big electrical retailer, a bit like the one, have you seen the 40-year-old virgin? No, I haven't seen that movie. I know I I've seen like clips of it. <laughs> okay, well, I mean that you know Steve Carell's character. He's he's an employee of this big electrical retail store, um, and I only mention that because then I could have segued into some funny stories about because there's two Asian characters in that 
movie that are always fighting each other and blaming other salespeople for taking their sales and all that sort of thing. And I actually worked with two people exactly like that. So if you ever see that movie, then we can have a conversation about it. But anyway, so for anyone listening who probably have seen it, um, I worked in a store that was pretty much like that. And, you know, it it was very transactional for most people. You had your KPIs that you had to hit, you know, selling extended warranties, all those kind of, you know, you had to, you were kind of encouraged to use all of the, what you would probably call sleazy salesperson tactics to try and get someone who maybe came in for just a TV to walk out having bought that TV on high interest credit with extended warranties of a VCR. Uh, there will be some of my listeners listening to this thinking, what the hell is a VCR? Um, so <laughs> back in the day, we didn't have streaming. We used to have our movies and things on physical media and it was a rectangle thing with two holes in it and it was called a VHS tape. And you stuck it in this electronic box that connected to your television and then the pictures came up on the screen if you've what am i talking about stranger things and stuff they're all set in the 80s people know what these things are um mm -hmm. so you know and it and it never ever sat well with me because it as an individual i've i've always gone about my life just wanting to help people where i can you know and it doesn't matter if it's someone who i see sitting on the pavement in trouble or someone who wants to buy something um you know i, I my my whole kind of thing is you know where are you at right now where do you want to get to how can i help you to get there and make sure that when you get there that you leave with the thing that is right for you not the thing that we're trying to push at the moment mm -hmm. um and and so i think just having that kind of attitude did stand me in good stead in the long term but in the early part of my career, it made life very, very difficult. You know, I was often called an, an, a management overhead by my sales managers because I would never do what they wanted me to do. Yet I was still getting the results. So you're you're 100 percent right. I remember working for a retail store and it, what was big is pushing opening up credit cards. Right. And yeah. the rule was ask every single person at the register. Well, I didn't want to do that, right? If somebody's buying a $20 thing or, you know, I just didn't want to do it. If it made sense for the client and um, they were purchasing a lot and it was going to save them, you know, $50 or whatever on their purchase, that's when I would approach it. I was number one for opening up credit cards, but they were still mad at me because I didn't ask every single person and it made no sense. But I was yeah. more strategic about it. And again, I was a kid, but I just, you know, intuitively, I'm like, why would I, you know, I wouldn't open a, up a credit card to save $4, you know? So I think sometimes they think, salespeople think you have to ask everybody. And just what you were saying, you were empathizing with those people, right? You were meeting them where they were, filling a need and helping them. and that doesn't always translate well to people that do not have that heart. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing that you were doing there at such a young age, not realizing it, and obviously your bosses weren't realizing it either, is that you were the living embodiment of the 80-20 rule. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, which is really how I'm trying to live my life as much as possible these days uh as I get Absolutely. older everything just gets more complicated unnecessarily. I always I always say like you will never go wrong by investing in people even if you never see them again you will never go wrong by investing in people and I try to live that in every aspect of my life but, you know, work is most of your life, right? That just, you yeah. know, your career just takes up so much. But it's always been so rewarding because I've operated that way. Yeah. And I, I th this is a, a very long-winded question that I'm going to ask you that probably won't have a question mark at the end of it. I'm just setting you up for this. Um, so... It's very hard for me to break down 
the methodology or the science behind what I do and how I do it because I don't think about it. I'm just doing things naturally. I'm not doing things that are against my natural grain, if this if that makes sense. Because some people do ask me, and I'll get some of my clients will ask me as well, because they'll be quite interested, you know, maybe for me to talk to some of their team members about what I do. Um, and it, and it's often in situations like where they're like, oh, I can't believe every time I come and see you, I buy all this stuff. And I just say to them, Look, I don't really say much the last 30 minutes. You were doing all the talking, but, you know, I'm just kind of guiding you to where you needed to be. Um but then when you get someone who is um this is probably not the this, the the way i the, the noun or adjective or whatever that i want to use but they're a bad salesperson but darlene even though i'm a bad salesperson i know i do all the bad salesperson things i want to change i want to be more like you i want to i want to care about people i want to how do you how do you take someone like that and break them down and then help them build back up as an empathetic relationship building nurturing caring person i think i've just answered my own question but um <laughs> anyway over to you do you know what i mean do you know what i'm trying yes. to describe absolutely it's so hard when you when you live your life doing things just in a very natural you're a natural empathetic sympathetic whatever person to to come from the other side of it it's so difficult to get your head into that mindset because you you generally like me you I'm sure we've spent our entire careers making sure that we don't do those things that we see other people doing that are just not right mm -hmm. so how do you how do you break that down and then build it back up so this might be a longer answer <laughs> as well oh, go for it um so I, you know, everybody has a zone of genius where your gifts, abilities, talents all intersect. That's your sweet spot, right? What is fascinating is most people do not know it's their zone of genius because it's so easy for them, right? So these things, that, and it, this has been a discovery in this past year alone with a lot of different things, because what I do, I, you know, you just assume everybody operates like that or they don't. There's nothing in between, right? Um, so I had a lot of people asking me those same questions, like, I don't know how to sell. I'm afraid to sell that type of thing. So I had to start really looking at, well, wait a minute. I just, I didn't learn how to do this. This was just an A, but how can I kind of break it down to, to transfer that knowledge to somebody else? So um, I, I broke it down into a couple of different things. First and foremost is really actively listening, listening to the person. Many times people get on a, a call or in retail, they already have in their mind what they want to sell, what their spiel is, all of those different things. And they're not even hearing what the person is saying. So when you really actively listen and discover what that person is looking for without having those preconceived notions, you already are setting yourself up to help them versus sell. Secondly, you know, looking at the person as a whole, not just what they are looking for, but budget, all of those different things. You don't want, so I'm sure you have people coming in. You don't want to have somebody that cannot pay off a credit card because they went crazy buying your suits or, you know, whatever it may be. And then yeah. you have to sleep at night, right? So you may make mm -hmm. that commission or make those sales or whatever, but you have to, you know, you have to sleep at night. What I try to do is even because I've worked where there's quotas and, and, you know, pressure and, and different things. So I'm not saying it's easy all the time, but if you operate with a generous mindset, like if I, if I sell authentically, empathetically, relationally, the right clients are going to come. They're going to be happy. They're going to be loyal. They're going to be singing their, you know, my praises versus the scarcity mindset of I have to sell every single person that comes through the store. Every sales call I have, I have to make a sale. So 
it really, that mind shift lets you operate in peace where you're like, I will, I will be successful if I just really care about the other person. And it may not be this month. There's times, you know, when it's hard, but eventually you're sowing those seeds. So I look at every sales call because I'm not in retail or fashion anymore, but every sales call is I'm sowing a seed. I'm going to bring value to that person regardless of if they buy for me now, a year from now, three years from now, or never, that I could give them value, give them, make them feel good and make them walk away with a positive experience. So I don't know if I answered your question or not, though. No, you did. That was brilliant. Thank you. I, um, there was something you were saying there and, uh, you know, you always kind of internalize it yourself and think, how do I, how do I apply that? How do I embody that? And, um, you know, one thing I say to my, my customers is, um, you know, if I, uh, you know, it's Thursday today, if we end up, if you're wearing my clothes and we end up, I don't know, on Saturday evening, we just happen to be in the same restaurant as each other. And I spot you from across the way. I'm not going to come and disturb, but I just want to be able to look across at you and be able to nod my head and say, I did a really good job for, for, for that person. I did write by them. I don't want to be messaging you saying, listen, I think I there's something that I have I've done that's not quite right and I need to speak to you on Monday because we need to sort it out. I never want to be in that situation. Yeah. I think that probably for you it's even more personal because you're designing the clothes and that's, you know, you have that pride, but everybody can take pride in their job of helping people. <clears throat> there is nothing more fulfilling in my job that I'm able to get somebody support or coach them or whatever and see them successful. Like that is exciting. That is rewarding that you can't put a dollar amount on that. When you see that people are succeeding because of things that you spoke into their life about. Yeah. I think the other thing that you said as well is that giving value to somebody, whether you, whether they buy from you now in a few months time in a few years time you, because sometimes you just never know how that relationship's going to develop i mean i've had people who haven't bought from me but we've stayed in touch because of some value that i give them whether it's through something that i said to them when i met them or spoke to them on the phone or email exchanges that i have with them over a period of time or now through the podcast because the podcast isn't really even about what i actually do as a day job I mean it's here because I like helping people and it, it gives me an outlet to be able to do that but but then the opportunities that have come my way as a result of that whether it's that person eventually getting in touch to say I need you now but because we built the relationship over that period of time and I've never it's never been transactional uh, or based on 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 you know the um concept that they have to have given me money in exchange for a product for me to then give them the time of day um or where i've just you know there's because of price or whatever i'm not someone that they were ever going to use but they know people in their own network and i've had people who've come to me and i've said to them how did you find out about me they will be like well um so-and-so told me about you and absolutely raved about you and I'm thinking to myself I didn't do a single piece of work for that person yeah but that can be the power of just nurturing relationships as well I I call them my evangelists I have I have people that I never have sold I have one lady in particular she calls me I think it's like every like 18 months or so. She's like, I'm going to use you soon. She will never use us. Right. But she needs troubleshooting for where she is like. And last time she called me and she's a typical entrepreneur scattered all over the place and, you know, just has a million irons in the fire. And I talked her off of a ledge. And when she was getting off the phone with me, she was like, Thank you so much for being my friend. And it really touched me because I've never met her. Like I said, I'll never do business with her, but she's also sent people my way. 
And because she knows people that can use the service or whatever it may be, but even if that never happened, doesn't make a difference. When you're operating authentically, that's rewarding in itself as well. The sales always come because people say, oh, like it sounds woo woo and, you know, um, like hippie, like, oh, peace and light, you know, that type of thing. But the reality is I'm a successful salesperson because people trust me and they know I'm going to, I'm a straight shooter. I'm from New Jersey, right? I'm, I'm a straight yep. shooter. So um, if it's not for them or it's not going to be the best solution or even with clothes, you know, people rely on you. You don't want somebody to go looking like an idiot because it wasn't the right cut or right fit for them. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, one, of, <laughs> one of my newer clients, it's been a slow burn with him because he's had a uh, uh, he has tailors already that look after his suit, and uh, but shirts has always been a problem for him. No tailor's been able to get the fit of his shirts right, and so I kind of recognized that through the process. So we met at a dinner with some mutual um friends, and we got talking about clothes. I think the host deliberately sat us next to each other. And, um, you know, he was, t- as soon as he found out what I did, he was like telling me all about his problems. And, and I, I was really trying, I was interested, of course, but I was really trying to not get too much into that conversation because then you can, I certainly just start to feel like, okay, now I'm being really salesy and I'm, you know, talking about my company all the time. I really want to focus on the other person and, 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 and find out as much about them as I can. But we kept in touch and then eventually we got together for an appointment on his terms. Um, And, uh, you know, rather than, I guess, what had happened with his previous shirt tailors before, I don't know, actually, but I kind of got the feeling that, you know, they'd straight away gone for the big sale and put half a dozen to a dozen shirts in his closet. And then he'd kind of come away not really feeling like he'd had good value because none of them fit the way he wanted and so on. And so, you know, I've been working with him since the beginning of December and normally it doesn't take that long, but I just kind of, it's really, it's really hard to articulate darling, but I've just, I just go on the way that I feel in my gut a bit like you with the whole store card thing, right? This person's not, you were probably as a teenager relying on pure instinct Mm -hmm. what that what that thing in your gut was saying to you that this is not right it's not right to take that step forward in this moment with this person um and that's what I've done with him and and so it's been you know one shirt fit it okay it's not quite where it needs to be we're going to do another one I haven't charged him for any of this either um Mm -hmm. because again that was based it's not a policy of mine in fact, it's actually against our policy, but again, it was all based on feeling. Mm-hmm. And um, my wife, who also runs a business with me, she and she's on the accounting side, so she's very, very strict about all of this kind of stuff. But but she trusts me enough to know that if I'm doing it, I'm doing it for a reason. And I couldn't even explain that, same as I can't explain it to you, I couldn't explain the reason. I was just like, look, my gut's just telling me with this guy, I need this is what I need to do. And so anyway, we do have a fitting booked in a couple of weeks time to finally make an impact on this part of his closet, which is awesome. But, you know, we were exchanging text messages together last night. Um, I found he runs a digital agency. uh, And uh, I mean, an amazing agency. And uh, I came across a contact who I was talking to And I was listening about some of the problems they were dealing with at work. And then I thought, hang on a second, my new, almost not quite a client, client, his agency could actually really help with a lot of your problems. And then I connected the two of them together. And so they're seeing each other in a couple of weeks. And he said to me yesterday, he said, thank you so much for that introduction. That could be absolutely huge for us. And I, I I just felt really warm and fuzzy and happy about that. Yeah. I don't know where I'm going with this and I don't know why I'm telling you all of this, but 
Yeah, no, I like I love connecting people, right? Like I yeah. if I'm not the right solution or if they need something else, like I love like, you know, connecting them with the right people and seeing that success. There that is very fulfilling. But something that you said and um with sitting next to him during dinner and you don't want to look salesy. I also am really passionate when I know I can help you and you're just in your own way. I'm kind of not aggressive, but like, I'm like, I really am passionate about making sure you understand like this is going to work for you or this is the right step. So I can see you sitting there like I can really help this guy. So it's not out of, I want to set, you know, sell, but when you're passionate about what you do, it, that's okay too, um, to know not to bother somebody at dinner or whatever, but if you're, you know, if that conversation opens up, that's okay. You don't have to just sit like a, you know, I'm, I'm not a wallflower and I don't not tell people what they do. In fact, I'm kind of bossy when I know I can help someone with my family. And that's because the relationships with my family, with my friends, like that's just how I operate. If I, if I think I can help you, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of boss you into it. Yeah. But you know, some of that is um, as much as it's about not wanting to come across as pushy or salesy or whatever, but some of it is actual fear. And fear really holds a lot of people back. A lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of self-starters, a lot of solopreneurs, um, they seem to be stuck on the runway and they just can't get into gear to start running down it because they're just so scared of talking to people um, picking up the fail, sometimes they don't even know what to do. So they spend all day kind of scrolling through LinkedIn and Instagram and so on, and just sort of dabbling in a bit of this and that, and, you know, watching videos and listening to podcasts. <laughs> um, <laughs> hopefully ones like this actually help them. Um, but how, how can we, how can we help people to eliminate that fear? Is there a process that you go through? You know, for me, it's the, I tell myself that if I I have a talent to help people in a very particular area of their lives and I think back to all the clients that I have helped and I constantly review the feedback that we get and realize that I'm actually doing lots of good things out there and I would almost be selfish if I wasn't telling other people to get the same sort of help rather than watching them flail around you know day after day that's how I overcome it. Um, but how do you approach that and take someone who is almost petrified of picking up a phone, getting in front of people, presenting and so on, and helping them to gain that confidence to put their best foot forward and and uh, and not hide in the shadows? Yeah, that's a great question because I my niche of like sales coaching is with coaches, consultants. These are brilliant people that have so much to offer. They're not shy. They know what they're doing. They're confident in their area. Where it gets a little muddy is maybe they built this business on referrals. So, you know, they they could have those conversations. And if they have a conversation with you and you're not sure, that's the end of it. They don't do follow-up. They don't do anything because they feel like it is salesy. So I tell them there's a couple of things. When you have that initial conversation, just treat it as a discovery for both of you. Share what you do, share what you have to offer, share, you know, just share about it, right? And then understand, again, back to hearing that person, what are their needs? What are their pain points? Because you want to, if you're not approaching it, like I have to sell Roberto, but I'm going to hear what Roberto has to say. And I'm going to see if he's a good client for me. He may not be. So it's a two-way street. So I think if you operate by having just a conversation, it takes that pressure off. Whatever has to do, you know, whatever, whatever the outcome is, is not in your control. People are big and I am not a numbers girl. I'm married to an accountant too, which is funny. Um, so, you know, spreadsheets give me hives. Like, I just want to see like, what's the bottom line, right? Like I just show me what's in the bank. I don't want to know the minutia. Yeah. Um, oh but... my God, Wait, this is a whole separate <laughs> conversation, darling, not for this, not for the podcast, but wow. Uh, carry on. 
thought yes. you, you are totally my hashtag my tribe. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, what I say is there's salespeople close 60% of your, you know, what's your conversion rate? What's this rate? What's, you know, what's your quota? When you're in that, you are, again, operating out of scarcity, you're operating out of fear, and you're putting a lot of pressure on yourself. If Mm -hmm. I talk to 100 people, and five of them want to move forward that are going to be great fits and successful, that's a win, right? It, so what if my conversion rate is two percent or or eighty percent? It, it there's a lot of factors that go into it. Where are you getting the leads from? What the, what are these conversations? Are these conversations like I had a lot of great conversations this month that did not move forward? I know they will probably within the next year. That's a win for me. So I think yeah. taking that pressure off of yourself to try to morph into a salesperson. You're not. It's one aspect. You're sharing what you do, whether it's a product or service. You're connecting with people, building that trust, whether or not they move forward with you, that they can trust that what you're saying is what you're going to stand behind. So even as you mentioned, if they can't use you, they can make referrals Or at the end of the night, you get to put your head on the pillow and know that you did your best that day and the other stuff is out of your control. Yeah. I think it's realizing that we're all human at the end of the day and a lot of what's taught sales-wise and whether that's through sales schools, um, what leadership teams teach, uh, what uh, organizations prescribe or, you know, that any number of tens of thousands of books that you can buy on online or in bookstores that you know promise to teach the actual selling system that if you implement the ideas in this book you'll be able to sell to anyone let me tell you anyone who's listening to this i've read a lot of books on sales i know darlene has as well and there is no magic bullet it's just not how it works because we're all different. We're all individuals. We've all got different things that we're struggling with, different attitudes to things, different, you know, we handle our emotions differently and so on. I think it's all, I think it, it is genuinely impossible for any one person to be able to sell to everybody because not everybody's right for everyone. Yeah, I think like there's that cliche, like, oh, if you're a good salesperson, you could sell ice to Eskimos. And why? Right? Like, yeah. Okay, you could sell they, anything. They don't need any more ice. Exactly. Like I, I could probably sell anything, right? You could probably sell anything if you wanted to. Um, but again, back to what is the right solution? What is the right product for that person? Speaking of books, I, I have to say, like I have read a million different books. One of the books that I read that was just so eye opening because I'm like, this is what I do. Oh my goodness, somebody actually wrote it. Was um, have you ever read um, Bob Berg's The Go Giver Sells More? No, I haven't. It's amazing. This man is a doll. He he put into words how I operated, and I was, and I didn't even know it was the thing, right? But it is, he has, he has a series of go-giver books and they're wonderful. And he operates with that generous mindset, that value add, that type of thing. And like I said, I've read a lot of books and that was the one that resonated because it it reinforced, because sometimes you think you're crazy. You're like, how could Mm. I be operating so differently than everybody else? You know, maybe I should be implementing these other things. I would say even even the things that we talked about, if it doesn't feel authentic to you, it's not you. You could take nuggets and make it your own and make it personalized where it feels natural because I can't sell like Roberta. You can't sell like Darlene and there's no reason why we should. So really gleaning, learning as much as you can. And like I said, this is an information age. You could take all the classes but it's also decision fatigue, right? You hear so much advice that you don't know and you start trying to morph into different things that you hear 
what I would say is learn as much as you can. There's always going to be a takeaway, even from a bad salesperson, you'll know how you don't want to operate. What didn't feel right with that interaction? I never want to have a client or a customer walk away feeling that way. So you can learn from the bad and you can learn from the good. That's with everything in life, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, you know, I'm look, I'm not saying that I've never hard sold someone. Of course I have, particularly in my younger years as well, when I was just starting out, because I have to, you have to, otherwise you're going to get fired. Or sometimes you'd be on a sales call and your, your, your boss would come with you. And so then you'd have to kind of perform for them. Otherwise the shower of, you know what, that they rained down in you just wasn't worth it. Mm -hmm. But every every I, I I still you know almost 20 years later remember every single time that I ever did it because I still feel the guilt to this day yeah I don't know if that's just normal catholic guilt but anyway <laughs> um it's we won't get into religion right now um but um but I still feel that every single day um and, you know I I took a decision more recently so there's one thing that I do I'm a hugger, but I just can't help it. I don't know what it is. I think, uh, you know, maybe it was my poor upbringing or something, but I just, I, I always, you know, people reach out to shake my hand and I'll just be like, I'll just hug them. That's uh, I'd, awesome. I'd be hugging you right now if I could. I can't reach down the Zoom call, luckily for you. And um, so hugging, change of, change of pace. So hugging Someone was asking me about it the other day and I said, you know what I, you know what it is? I'm all about energy. I'm all about good energy, right? I want to yeah. hang out with people that have good energy. Um, I want to, I want to serve people because when I work for people, I work my hardest. I give everything that I have until the tank is completely empty and I will probably work that way till the day I die. Um, but to be able to give that much of yourself to someone the the energy's got to be right you've got to want to there's got to be that connection there you've got to want to go the yards for your client the same way you would for your best friend or for a member of your family um and hugging kind of is the same thing you can't just hug anybody Mm -hmm. right if there's not that kind of spark or connection there it just doesn't work. So the the gentleman I was explaining, um, I was telling you about this whole shirt thing. We've been hugging since the moment we met each other, pretty much. Like I think we shook hands the first time, and then the second time it was. Hugged. And uh, you know, I think that also kind of goes back to something that someone, I think it was a sales manager, like about eighteen years ago. He he was giving like a morning meeting. And uh, he was talking about the concept of wouldn't it be great if you could just go at, like all your sales calls, like you looked at your diary every single day and your sales calls were, were just full of people that you regarded as friends. Yeah. But you just yeah. had that relationship with them. And it mu- that must have stuck with me quite early on because then it my whole kind of career since has been about trying to network, connect build relationships with people so that if they did turn around to me and say hey Bobby do you fancy grabbing dinner together sometime I'd be like yeah I'd love to do that that'd be awesome yeah I never want to be working with someone who I wouldn't want to hang around with yeah but or they maybe wouldn't want to hang around with me isn't it just a nice nicer way to be in the world Absolutely. And I I just want to touch upon one thing you were saying, like with the guilt and different things, because I know there's probably like a lot of young listeners that are going to be hearing this and, you know, being where we are now in our careers, I don't want to be a big shot and say, oh, I like it's I've always operated 100 percent like this. You know, it's a journey. What I would say is give Mm -hmm. yourself grace. Like, give yourself grace for the mistakes that you made. We, We I still make mistakes all the time. Give yourself grace, take feedback, learn and and go with your instincts. And it's like any other craft, you can keep getting better at it and keep making it your own. Just because you are not typically a salesperson 
or maybe you you had some bad um, examples of what you should be as a salesperson doesn't mean you can't redirect the course, right? That's like, that's the beauty of life. We could reinvent ourselves all the time and just, you know, take these little nuggets and, you know, even if it's micro, you know, micro little milestones, take those wins, let go of the losses. I am one to beat myself up over things and it's not fun and it's, it's not a great way to be. Let go of the losses, let go of the mistakes and, you know, look at your wins and keep that will keep fueling you because then you get that that's rewarding. That's where you really can come into your own. Yeah, I love that. Um, So we've been talking about uh, the kind of seller and potential client or prospect sort of relationship. I just want to just bring that up to the uh because i was i i recorded an episode with peter peter anthony recently he's the author of the book collabora dabra um and he so he's a real thought leader on on the concept of collaboration and he's a wonderful guy like he's based down in australia he's an absolute hoot to spend time with um but then I can actually, do you know what? I should connect you you two together because you'd get on I really, really well. I would love it. Love, you would love his way of thinking and his approach. Um, but I have a feeling as much as um, you advocate this uh, concept of, co- really, that's what it is. It's collaboration with your prospects, with your customers and so on. Doing the same, encouraging doing the same with the people that you quote unquote compete with, right? So you take my industry, for example, there's one guy um, who is in a group. I really, I, I'm guessing some of them will listen to this and look, uh, do you know what? I'm not <laughs> going to apologize. Hopefully everyone can learn something from it. Yeah. Um, same industry as me in the same kind of businessy sort of network. And I not had the opportunity to meet with him face to face for the best part of six months. And then at an event recently, we crossed paths. So I went my usual self, um, introduced myself. Hi, Roberto. I've heard so much about you. I'm so sorry we've not actually met face to face, but I'm it's, I'm so happy to see you here. And I really wanted to talk to him to find out more about what he does in my space where there might be an opportunity for me where I can't serve somebody to be able to pass that person to someone else. Because I never, mm-hmm. if someone's not a good fit, no pun intended, um, <laughs> I I never want to just leave them high and dry. I want to say, look, I'm not the right person or I can't take this on for you, but I know this person that might be a really good fit um, and then refer them on. And um, I didn't get the right sort of vibe um and uh i felt i was then practically kind of dismissed ignored for the rest of the mm-hmm. thing because i wasn't someone that he could sell to yeah yeah i do the same thing as him so he saw me as competition where i was looking to try and engage with him from a collaboration point of view um but i it that hasn't put me off so i've actually since started to build relationships with some other tailors that do things that I don't do so well. And then obviously they know there are things I do much better than they do. And we've already been starting to just pass referrals to each other. And it's such a nicer way to be because it reduces the the other uh, side of fear that can come in to, um, and hit people is where they're not only scared of picking up the phone and, and, and kind of telling prospects about themselves, they're also kind of scared because they're just, they're thinking that the competition's out there. And that they can't compete with all the other sharks that are in the water. Yeah, that you just touched upon a great point. And I wish I could say I did this throughout my career. And I did not because I think, you know, being young, I didn't realize like competition, I was insecure, right? And you think, oh, well, I have to just 
say what, you know, what I do best or why we're better than them or anything like that. But, you know, again, age, wisdom, all of that. Collaboration is one of the most powerful tools out there. There is enough business for everybody. That's again, the generous mindset, right? Where if you're not the right person, how much more credible are you if you can say, you know what, we don't really do it that well, but I think, or, you know, for me, a lot of times people, it's price or whatever it may be. I'll be like, Hey, you know, I, this is what we have, but you do need help. You're not ready for us. This I've heard some good things about this company. It's not going to be the same level, but it'll give you a good start. So doing that, I also have people in my network that they do certain things that we do not. And we send them referrals. They send us referrals. And it's just a really nice way to be and to and and I have people that are directly direct competition, right, with what we do. And then we'll have calls to say, you know, well, why are you different? And I never, I never speak negatively about the competition. All I do is Mm. highlight where the differences are. Know your competition well enough to know what you offer that they don't and without disparaging your competition. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Darling, people want to connect with you. Um, well, actually, do you know what I wanted to ask you? Because we just took on a VA recently, and um, that's uh, that's your day job, right? Yes. You run yeah. a VA firm. So I'm You're the director. saving people time. Yes. I, so d- I'm the director of business development. We have all U.S.-based VAs. I help leaders, entrepreneurs, really um, get that right-hand person, get out of the minutia, stay in their zone of genius, stay at the visionary and um, get them really quality support at a fractional, at a fractional basis. So a lot of my clients are, you know, smaller businesses, entrepreneurs, they don't need somebody 40 hours a week. They may need somebody five hours a week, but getting poor quality just makes more work, right? Any busy leader, they can do all of it, you know, and even when you built your business, there's a time and a place when you have to roll up your sleeves and do everything. And then there's a time where you have to start looking at it. Now, can I do it? But where is my time better spent? Where, you know, what can I remove off of my plate to keep as that place of strategy and vision? to continue to grow the company. So that's that's what our company does. And we do have um, international clients as well. Yeah. Wow. So, oh God, you're such a busy lady. I don't know how you do it. Um, I do know how you do it because I'm trying to run four businesses at the moment. Um, <laughs> brilliant. How um, I have, um, which I'm going to put in the show notes. So I have your LinkedIn uh thing your yes. LinkedIn link <laughs> how how else can people reach out to you sure so they can um connect with me on LinkedIn I'm a LinkedIn queen I'm always on there so that is the best way to connect with me or if they're looking for a virtual assistant or want to hop on my calendar going to peachtreeva.com if you put an inquiry you'll get on my calendar and I'm happy to chat with anybody who is struggling with support, struggling with sales, or, you know, just wants to make a connection. I'm, I love connecting with people. Brilliant. And I've absolutely loved connecting with you today. LinkedIn is a whole other conversation. And I don't know if you've just dropped yourself in it by um, calling yourself the LinkedIn queen. Um, but expect to see me pop up on your schedule at some point <laughs> yes <laughs> I'm well, just trying to I, I I've I'm been on LinkedIn. I've been on the platform since it first came out so years and years and years but I've never really utilized it um and I and actually have you got a few minutes can we get into this quickly I have five more minutes okay I'll make it two so okay. um LinkedIn is a prime example 
And I think that's why I've not really got into it that much. So what I've started doing recently is where I'm producing my value content on Instagram Reels, et cetera, which is how to's and guides and things like that. I'm putting that value content onto LinkedIn, but I'm not going out there trying to connect with just about anyone who might be a prospective client. And the reason why I'm not doing that is because I get a barrage of people trying to connect with me that have not even read my profile. It's just throw mud at a wall. They're just doing all the bad stuff that you don't want to do. Yeah, I can't remember where I was going with this, but but yeah, but LinkedIn. Are, are you kind of how are you how are you utilizing that platform? Sure. So I've been on the platform for years, but it has been the most. I would say from March of last year, when I was leaving my other position until now is I've learned. And when I stepped into the role of the developer, you know, director of business development, the company that I worked for did not have a digital footprint. It ha- it was a great company. It was bought by someone in March. And then I came on in April and I'm like, I, and we're business to business, right? So Um, I just started learning. And again, I'm an information hound. I do not sleep. I'm obsessed with TikTok. And (laughs) I'm like a 14 year old um, mentally, but I just started learning tips and tricks. So one of the things was put video out. I hate myself on video. I'm like, so again, back to collaboration. I'm like, I know a lot of smart people. I'll just do little videos and interview them. Not a podcast, but under 10 minutes value add type of thing. So I started doing that. Um, Content, content, it is a machine putting out content all the time. But I am blessed because I have an incredible virtual assistant who is like Wonder Woman. She's better than me now. She We learned together and now she kind of owns that space. So yeah. um, it's really building your personal brand as well as your business brand. Any post that I make personally gets more responses, more engagement than anything else. I have the blessing of having a hundred year old grandmother who is like feisty Italian from New York. And I will shamelessly use her as content all day long. And it always gets, but I've met such great people through there. So yes, You get sold a lot. You get a lot of connections and, you know, spam and that type of thing. But it's like anything else. But also I stay away from the other platforms. So that makes it easier um, because my clients not really Instagram or or Facebook. So I don't I just so engaging in one platform does make it easier for me. Yeah. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm I'm obviously conscious of time for you. Um, Darlene, have you had fun? It was a blast. I wish you were like, I want you to come to Orlando or I want to go to London. Like I want to (laughs) hang out with you. I got some new clients recently that are from Florida. Um, So Naples and Fort William, I want to say. Um, So I've, I've already been invited over and I will be heading over to your part of the world at some point in the next 12 to 18 months, if not sooner. Yeah, I have a brother in Naples, so I will meet you there. It's a beautiful area. So I'll come see you. Awesome. I'm so stoked that I got to spend time with a Jersey girl today. I've missed that accent. Um, <laughs> so thank, So just for that alone, thank you so much. And uh, thank you all so much for joining Darlene and I today. Hit the share button to send this podcast on. For someone you know who could benefit from the things we discussed on this episode, you can find Taylor and Talk on Instagram at Taylor and Talk Podcast for updates on new episodes. And you know I love feedback. Email me at taylorandtalkpodcast at gmail.com. If you want to support the show further, hit the link in the show notes. Have a great week. Be good to each other. And I'll see you on the next one.